Hey, what's up guys? This is Alex and today we're gonna do a long and detailed analysis of this Hans Zimmer cover I wrote by ear in the style of Bloodborne and Dark Souls. So we're gonna listen to the track first and then we're gonna talk. Not a bad track, the mixing was a bit terrible from my part, but the arrangement I think I nailed it, and I wrote it entirely by ear without music theory knowledge, right? So if you're asking yourself, what the, where the hell did you learn all this stuff, and you know, are oblivious to how to proceed to learn this stuff, the first good news is that this YouTube tutorial channel is where I put all my four years of expertise with doing music in tutorials for you guys to learn from, right? So there's lots of videos like this on my channel. And the second thing is that where I learned this, the first source for me was a course called Cinematic Music from Idea from to Finished Recording. That course is now available and it has four times as the material is much more updated than it was back in the day. And it's available on Evanant. And if you want to check it out, the link is in the description of this video. And that course, you can find information about how to produce, how to arrange, compose orchestral music, how instrumentation works, how to mix and master orchestral music and stuff like that. It talks about everything. It takes you from the very basics to the level of the pros. And the cool thing about the course is that the guy who does it, like the guy who wrote it, Arne Anderson, who's a friend of mine, is an insanely skilled composer. And he's a modern composer. He's, you're, with that course, you're not studying music of people who are dead and stuff like that. You're studying the music that is used now is used nowadays in video games, films, TV series and stuff like that. How to compose that type of music, right? So, if you're interested in building yourself a composer career but you do not know where to start, that course and this channel I think are one of the best places to do that. So again, link to the course is in the description of this video. But without further ado, let's get into the analysis of this Hans Zimmer vs. Bloodborne track. So this track is a cover of a Hans Zimmer track we all know called Dream is Collapsing. But I, when I wrote this, I rewrote this by ear as usual. But when I rewrote this, I challenged myself to do that in the style of Bloodborne and Dark Souls. And for those of you who do not know Dark Souls or Bloodborne, those two are games where um, the soundtrack is reminiscent of uh, O Fortuna from Carmina Burana or, for example, you know, that type of apocalyptic uh, 
the apocalyptic side of orchestral music. You know, those tracks from Bloodborne, they're written in that dark apocalyptic tone that you do not have as much, for example, in trailer music or soundtracks, some soundtracks. It's very distinctive, a very distinctive type of orchestral music. And I wanted to learn more about it. So I challenged myself to write music in that style. And I discovered quite a few things that I'm going to tell you now in this tutorial. So let's start from the very uh, basic distinctions, the very core ideas behind this style. First, minor uh, harmonies, minor chords and stuff like that. This track is, I think, in a minor scale, a minor um, tonality. And uh, there's lots of minor chords and stuff. It sounds so dark and you know, ominous. And when I, when I wrote this by ear, I made some mistakes, of course. And I noticed that the chord progression I wrote was more cheerful because I didn't dare go so low. But when you're writing this type of, of music, you shouldn't, like, you shouldn't be afraid of sounding uh, demonic, almost sounding very like this is, these are type of tracks that you hear in the games where the world is about to end and you face these huge enemies that tower over you. So these tracks are supposed to sound super dark, unpleasant at times. So it's good to even use dissonances and lots of minor chords. So minor chords and dissonances are the core. And the third thing is that the instrumentation itself, it's very dull. There's lots of tubas, chimbasi, basses, cellos, and not as much like there are some violins and stuff like that, but you have no high woodwinds, for example, and the percussion is very dull. We have timpani, toms, but uh, we do not have the hybrid type of very sharp percussion. And there is a reason for that, which I'm going to mention later in this tutorial, but the whole instrumentation as well is dull, dark, doesn't go as like as sharp as other instrumentations. And this is to create a sense of darkness, narrowness, and... Uh, that helps into conveying that apocalyptic feel, feel to the track. And I'm going to explain that as we go through this tutorial. But uh, the first, fourth thing that I want to mention is the libraries I use. So for the, um, for the strings and uh, choir, I use two new libraries, which I'm also going to review in, um, in a few days, I think. The, the strings library is called Fluid Shirts. And the two libraries are from Performance Samples, which is this company which makes this uh, sort of minimalistic libraries, but their sound is amazing. Now, the strings, in this case, they sound very tight because you have lots of those ostinatis like this. So for this type of ostinato, we better use strings that sound tight. And Fluid Shorts from Performance Samples is the best choice for that because for that, because you have ultra tight patches and they sound amazing and also very close. While the choir, it's best if you use a choir that, in this case, I use Oceania from Performance Samples. And the reason why is that this choir is super powerful and there's lots of vibrato. And I'm going to mention later the importance of vibrato in a choir for this type of music. But this is what Oceania sounded like. And uh, for example, in the strings, I also use Metropolis Arc 1, which I used too in the brass. All this is Metropolis Arc 1, the library I use all the time, by the way. And for the percussion, I used Epic Toms from Eitaio and Rhapsody Orchestral Percussion from Impact Soundworks. So those are the main libraries I used for this track. And now let's get into um, the arrangement. Let's see how I arranged this track. Now that I told you everything, the core ideas and the core libraries I, use, I used, I'm going to tell you the mindset behind this arrangement. Now, this track was originally written by Hans Zimmer. So the composition is, you need to keep in mind, it's Hans Zimmer's composition. So it might not be like, it, 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 is, it is in the style of Bloodborne because I arranged it in a style of Bloodborne. But in terms of, of composition, we're going to study now how Hans Zimmer uh, composed this track. So let's analyze, for example, um, yeah, let's analyze the track um, as, as it goes. So the structure is split in three parts, the A part, the B part, and the C part. I'm going to talk about these parts as the track goes. So let's check out how Hans Zimmer composed this track, started with very simple ideas. So the strings, for example, start like this. So very simple synatis. Now, um, there needs to be said the original instrumentation orchestration is different because I arranged this in Bloodborne style, but the main concept behind uh, 
the arrangement is the same. So he starts pretty much with this bass doing this, right? Which is very straightforward, but the thing is that this bass does this for the whole of the A and B part. And then below that though, after a while, we have another layer of basses playing this. So this is a detail I added to enforce the bass here. Now, below the bass, which pretty much does this for the whole thing. Like if we left the thing like this with nothing else below it, it would be uninteresting. But what Hans Zimmer does is that he always adds details, right? So along with the bass, we have some cellos which are doing two things. So this two. So we have one cello doing this ostinato thing here, which is what the guitar does in the original track. And then we have a cello doing this. No, no. This is a tremolo articulation. And by the way, if you want to write very professional orchestral music, you should try to use as many articulations as you can, as I explained in other tutorials. And so yeah, we have these cellos which are doing this and the other are playing another ostinato. And again, if we left this thing and repeated it like we did, by not adding nothing else, it would be uninteresting. But we save the day by, for example, adding another cello voice below um, what we have here. So after a while, after the user, sorry, the listener has, um, uh, has begun, the user began accustomed to the basses and cellos, we add something else, this. This type of ostinato, you would hear it all the time in Bloodborne, sing, Bloodborne and games like this. And again, I'm repeating this throughout, but you know, before this gets boring, before all of this, before all of this gets boring, I add something else. So um, after a while, we have some violas. So you see like the mindset behind this, right? If you add another detail at the time. And the cool thing about these details is that they're not taking away from, from the others. They are building on the same harmony, the same foundation, same accents. So when played together, they sound as a one thing only, but I'm introducing them uh, bit by bit so that the strings keep on being interesting. So after a while, we have these violas. There is one layer which is playing the ostinati from the, the ostinato from the cellos. And another layer which is enforcing some harmonies. Like it's enforcing the, the harmony, enforcing the harmony by playing some very simple notes, which are already being played by other stuff. And then after a while, it starts to play another thing again. So yeah, that's it for the violas. Then we have some violins doing the tremolos as well. Like these tremolos. And then in the end, we have the second violins doing um, this. And in here, this is a good example of what it means to change articulations. Like we have the violins playing spiccato notes, but we also have in between, we have these longer notes, which are a uh, portato, I think. So changing, changing articulations like that, like can uh, lead you to write more interesting patterns. After a while in the first violins, we have another voice to bring the track forward, which is doing a chromatic decrescendo, we can call it, I think, I'm not sure, this thing here. Now I call this chromatic because it's playing uh, notes that are even outside of the scale. And this is where we start to hear the first dissonances. And now dissonances, they're not pleasant, right? But what we'd want here with this type of track is to 
put the listener not at ease, but unease. Like we want this track to have a logic, to make sense, but we want it to convey danger, darkness. So in Bloodborne music, there's lots of dissonances, more than there are in this track. And now Hans Zimmer in this track didn't, didn't use me, like lots of dissonances like in Bloodborne, so I couldn't put so many, but I tried. And um, in the tra- original track, we have this passage. And uh, now this doesn't make too much sense, it creates dissonances, but it also creates a sense of danger stuff that, that's approaching. And the passage here, sorry. Sounds like that. So um, I use that, you know, those chromatic decrescendos or whatever we want to call them from here because I wanted to pre-announce this transition and also because I wanted to create that sense of danger, tension, stuff like that. So uh, using chromatic passages is actually a pretty cool thing to do and uh, you shouldn't be too much afraid of dissonances if you're writing dark, apocalyptic orchestral music. Now, um, you know, while analyzing the strings, we pretty much, you know, um, I pretty much showed you what happens. Like in the A part, we pretty much have the lower strings, you know, the cellos, the violas, and the basses. We're playing at lower octaves. And as the A part goes on, the octaves increase. Like here it's low, here it's a bit higher. And in the B part, it gets higher. And we start to have violins. This means that it means that the track pretty much is opening up. It's becoming, it's reaching more octaves. It's becoming broader and, you know, brighter as well. So it's opening up. And the B part, like the A part, is serves the purpose of introducing the main ostinatis, main ideas, main motives. And the B part takes those motives, 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 and... Uh, <laughs> brings them to their apotheosis, like the, the, the highest levels of intensity. Now in the strings, we did that by adding second violins and first violins and stuff. But let's see how we did that in the brass, for example. After, we're going to check out the C part, which is a completely different beast. Now in the brass, we did pretty much the same thing. We started with the dullest, the darkest, the most low brass, and we built upon. Built upon. So in the beginning, um, we used bass trombone and shimbassi and tubas. Now, I, use, I, I should have said in the beginning, um, I should have made that remark about the brass. In trailer orchestral music, like epic orchestral trailer music and stuff like that, you tend to not use tubas and shimbassi as much because it sounds so low. There is not necessarily a need for that type of low end in the brass, in, ty- in that type of music. But in this one, where we need something, like we need dark and dullness, Simbasi and tubas are very amazing. So I use them in the intro to do this, which is very simple. And this pretty much accompanies the bass. Now in here, I also did like the, I tweaked, like sometimes I use staccato notes, other times I use this crescendo flutter tongues. So, Again, it's a good thing to articulate your stuff. And the thing here where I change articulation by changing color, I do this with a plugin called BRSO Articulate. I made a tutorial about that on the review. If you want to check it out, it's on the channel. Now let's check out the rest. So we have this uh, Chimbasi playing, right? After a while, because we don't want it to sound boring, we add details. So we add this voice of tuba. And we also added some bass trombone, which is here, which is pretty much um, playing the same thing as the chimbasi, but with a different register, kind of. More sharp. So when we hear the chimbasi, bass trombone, etc., together, which alone they might sign, sound like boring, but if we put them to with the strings. starts to feel a bit interesting. Then after that, I added some French horn, which are playing the same uh, notes as the tuba, but on higher octaves on a higher register. 
sorry, it's not the same note as a tuba, but I think this is the root note, the bass note. And then after a while, again, I wanted to make this more interesting, so I added another voice of French horns. Why not? And as you might have might have noticed, in the lowest instruments, so the, the double basses, the cellos, the bass trombones, the tubas and stuff, I'm not playing very complicated chords, right? I'm just playing the root chord, like the root note of the chord. And I'm also playing, um, you know, fifths and other notes, which are like, how to say, they're not the most harmonically complex notes to couple, to couple up with those root notes, right? I'm not creating entire chords with the bass instruments. The reason for that is that if you do that, you create, like if you, if you play complex notes on a very bass, on a, on a instrument that has a bass register, a low register, you create some clutter in the mix. So for example, uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm gonna play a C chord on the tuba. Well, it didn't, didn't sound too bad actually, but See this? Like it, it's not so pleasant, but if we do this on the French horn instead, it's much more clear, right? Because uh, there, is a, there is an explanation for this, and I think I mentioned it in the equalization tutorial, but basically the lower um, a sound is, the more harmonics it's going to have. So this is what a very low C sounds on tuba looks like, like it's very distributed, right? There's lots of harmonics. Well, if I play a very high C on an instrument with a high register, it's thinner. It gets a very thin and very um, precise type of distribution. So when we play a chord progression, or sorry, a chord, a high chord on an instrument that has a high register, blah, blah, we get a very distributed and precise, you know, precisely distributed harmonics. While if we do that on a low uh, register and low octaves. It's so distributed and cluttered, so this creates problems in the mix. So for the lowest instruments, which are fundamental for this type of music, I am using very, very basic harmonies. Mostly the, the bass notes of the root, um, sort of the root notes of the chord progressions, and some other tones, but that are, you know, quite distant from the root, uh, the root notes and that do not create clutter. So pretty much creating chords with two notes, right? Nothing too complex on the low instruments. But on the French horns, I am using, since they are on a higher register, I'm also, uh, you know, using melodies and stuff like that. So this is what the French horns sound like after a while. We have that, like this, um, where is it? This thing here. So first thing we have um, some crescendo. So this uh, pink thing. And then we have this. We can consider this a melody pretty much, and it's playing on the higher octaves and on the higher register. First, because there, it's not as cluttered, there's not as much stuff in there now in this part. And second, because it's more recognizable, you know, the highest type of like, higher tonalities are more noticeable by our ears. And another cool thing is that it's playing alternating with the other stuff. So. There's, you know, the low brass that does boom, and then there's the French horn melody that goes after when the low brass is shutting, shutting up, uh, the French horn uh, melody comes in. So you have that call and response, call and response action going on, which is very important for any arrangement. Now, after, like below that French horn uh, stabs, melodic stabs, we also have some trumpets, which are playing the same stabs, this. But I processed them and lowered the volume a lot because first I didn't want to clutter the mids and Metropolis Arc has lots of mids in the, in the trumpets. For this trumpet, I just wanted to sharpen, sharpen the French horn. So um, the trumpets are the highest instruments in the, in the brass, right? So 
um, they have more high frequencies and they sound sharper than anything. Now, if I put those on a very low, at a very low volume, but below the French horns, it's gonna make the French horns sound since they are in the same register, but not sharp, not as sharp. If I put them together, it's gonna make the French horn sound more sharp. Sorry. Compared to. Now, this is called layering, and it's a very useful technique, and I'm gonna show you later the impact it has. On the C part, there's lots of layering, and that's why it sounds huge. But if you want to learn more about it, I made a tutorial called um, How to Create Huge Cinematic Impacts or with Layering, or something like that. And while that tutorial explains you about cinematic impacts, it has lots of knowledge about um, all types of layering, really. So. Check that out if you want to learn about layering. And now let's talk about the choir. So the choir, it's um, it follows the same reason, like same uh, mindset as the rest. Starts very simple and it progresses, gets more detailed as the song goes. Now I mentioned this choir is done with Oceania and um, it sounds fucking amazing. And I'm gonna tell you why. But first, let's check it out. So it starts like this, right? Very simple. And this is done to pretty much accompany the bass and give it a bit more air because, uh, you know, choir is a more airy sound, more, I don't know, it has more breath and stuff like that, so... So I added it like this, and then as the track goes, I made it evolve harmonically by adding more voices. So after a while we have this. Again, as I said before, I'm not playing too much complex harmonic things on the low register, right? But after a while, on higher octaves in the man choir, I added two things. First, um, this, pretty much. Voice. And this we can consider pretty much a melody or a counter melody, depending on what is going on in this part. And where did I add this again? All right. Um, yeah, below that, I have another voice. This voice, which is playing a melody. And before that part comes in, before that voice gets introduced, I added this. This is like choral rises or, or shouts and stuff like that. So when it comes in, it sounds like this. And this is actually also the part that coincides with the beginning of the B part where things start to really get more intense. So that's why I added that melody on the men choir. And after a while, we have the same melody, I think, but played on the women choir on the last part of the, of the B part. No, it's, it's not the same, but maybe like this, this melody, I think when I copied it, like I based it on the French horns. Uh, melody that we heard before. Yeah, it's playing sort of the same notes to enforce the French horns. And I didn't want to have too, too many melodies going on because as I mentioned in the melodies tutorial, if you do not make your melodies cooperate sometimes and you make them sit in the same register and be so different and stuff that creates uh, a sense of what the fuck should I listen to, right? Because there are two melodies which are both as strong and they're different and that creates a bit of confusion. So when you use more melodies, a good thing to um, make sure that, sorry, make sure that they're, they're cooperating. Another remark I want to do about the choir is that they're playing vibratos. So with vibratos, I mean stuff like this.
like that type of, oh, you know, it's not like, oh, it's a, oh, it changes all the time. Like there's a bit of variation to how they're singing that, that vibration in the vowels, in the, in the, um, in the singing, that's called vibrato. You can also have that on string instruments, for example. And vibrato makes everything sound more, like it makes things sound more intense, more expressive. But the coolest thing is that you have those changes in tonality. Now, if you're playing, um, um, sorry, uh, notes, multiple notes at minor intervals with vibrato, that creates very interesting dissonances because... Um, with vibrato, you're kind of all over the place, slightly, but kind of all over the place in terms of tonality when you play those notes. So if you play two notes which are at a minor interval, maybe diminished intervals and stuff like that, it kind of, um, like you, you touch tonalities that might not blend together harmonically. So you get that sense of danger, sense of unpleasantness in the choir, which is what we're after here. I'm not saying that you need to write notes randomly, but if you have a bit of latent dissonance in your arrangement, that's very nice for this type of music. Another cool thing about the choir here is that it's super, super powerful. And the library I've used here, used here is performance samples, Oceania or Oceania. You shouldn't get um, eluded by the simple graphical user interface because this library is bananas. It's my second favorite now to Metropolis Arc. And it has like this, um, like it's sort of like Storm Choir where you have one patch, which is both staccato and marcato. Like I didn't have to tweak the articulations here. I just wrote some shorter notes and some high, uh, some longer notes. And this library kind of fits and understands and allows you to both write short notes that sound effective and long notes that sound effective. And those vibratos are amazing. Some libraries maybe might even allow you to go even more in depth in vibratos, but you know, as long as it's not a non vibrato patch, you're going to have those sort of latent dissonances, which is great. All right. So, uh, yeah, pretty much the same thing, like all the time, right? It starts basic and it gets more intense. We also have that on the percussion where it starts like this. Very simple timpani. Nothing too cluttered. And then after a while, we start to have tubular bells. which are also playing a bit of the harmonic stuff, like a bit of melodies and stuff, very simple way, but they are, they are playing those melodies. Then we have, sorry, let me enable this. Then we have, um, yeah, toms get added to the whole thing. And you hear, like, it's not playing, they're not playing exactly the same things as the, as the timpani. They are playing at the same time as the timpani, but they, we also have these percussion feels like this. Bam, 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 right? Because I wanted to make things more interesting. Now, one error I see people making is not adding those details. In general, they're not using multiple articulation. They're not adding percussion feels. They're keeping things as, it is, as, they, as they are throughout the whole track. And that's why it sounds uninteresting and unprofessional because professionals do not write music like that. They add details as it goes. And um, so one thing you should take care of is adding details as the track goes. And uh, yeah, also stupid details like gongs, like in the beginning here. If I were to remove this gong, like, let's check out how the track would sound without gong and how it would would with the gong. Actually, let me remove this as well. I mean, it's okay, but it's not this. Those gongs and orchestral cluster create, create a bit of atmosphere, more uh, making the whole thing more incisive, right? So. Um, gongs, now let's see where they are playing in the spectrum of frequencies. Here, in the mid-high, which are not that much populated, 
by the timpani, I think. So that's why the gongs shine so much. They're filling a space which is not that much occupied in terms of percussion. But the most important um, percussive sound of the probably not the most important, probably not the most important, but the most noticeable are cymbals. You see how, like, like check out how the track sounds huge when the cymbal comes in. If I were to remove it, 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 would, it would have a bit of a less of dramatic, dramatic impact. But yeah, I should also increase the volume a little bit to make it more noticeable. So this is without cymbal. And this is with the cymbal. With the cymbal, we have the high frequencies which get very populated because cymbals. Check out their frequency spectrum. They sit around here, where nothing else sits in the track. As I said in the beginning, the orchestration is supposed to be dull and dark. And the, the lack of high frequencies makes it sound so. But the cymbals, they populate those frequencies a lot. So when we use them in an arrangement where there is no, there isn't a lot of high frequencies, they you can really hear them. And for those few seconds, the track sounds as if it's opening up. After a while, it gets again narrow because we have a, the lack of symbols, but then we also use them sometimes here to make uh, some passages more intense. So. If I were to remove the symbols again, You notice how the track doesn't open up as much, so it's very important to use them, but use them, uh, um, you know, not all the time in this type of music. Now, in orchestral uplifting music, like, I don't know, How to Train Your Dragon, the, uh, the score from John Powell, or in trailer music also, you have lots of high frequencies because those tracks are supposed to sound energetic, huge, and very overwhelming in terms of upliftingness and stuff, right? While Bloodborne music is supposed to be dark, more intimate, more ominous. It doesn't need to sound so huge to scare the shit out of you, right? So um, when like the, the, um, the spectrum of frequencies of your track determines the color, if it's dark or bright. Dark tracks do not have so many high frequencies, Bright tracks have high frequencies. They have high woodwinds, which are sitting around here and lots of percussion with uh, sticks and sharp edges to them that have those sharp, uh, you know, frequencies and stuff. That's why they sound so open and cheerful because there's lots of high frequencies and stuff, you know, right? It's super wide. While um, these tracks, like Bloodborne tracks, they're more dull. So there isn't lots of high frequencies. And you can use, make use of the lack of high frequencies to your advantage by using symbols in the parts that you want to uh, empathize, em emphasize, sorry. All right, so those were the A and the B part. That's how they were wrote, written. Simple idea, getting ideas, getting more detailed as the track goes. And I wanted to showcase how that happened on every single instrument because I wanted to impress upon you the importance of doing that. Because the first mistake beginners do is they do not add details enough to their tracks. So try to use more articulations, try to add percussion fills, try to add more voices as your track goes on, and every detail, the key is that every detail needs to sit perfectly inside the main idea. So when I added the percussion fills, I made sure they were sitting inside the, same, the, the main rhythm and that the toms were also playing on the main uh, accents, right? When I added spiccatis, I made sure that the rhythms, you know, the, the accents were the same and that they were playing notes inside the main, the main rhythms, inside the main harmony and stuff like that. So you want to add details inside the thing. It's sort of like fractals, right? When you watch, a, look into a fractal, inside the fractal, there is another image. Inside the other image, there is another image again. So we can learn a lot about how to write music from fractals. Anyway, now let's look at the C part. And before the C part, we have um, 
something that breaks everything we built so far. We have, as I showed you, that chromatic, the chromatic crescendo in the violins. And in here, we experience it on all the instruments, sort of. So there are two things happening, like that chromatic scale on every instrument, instrument on different octaves and sometimes on different, um, sometimes different notes as well, create more, create more harmonic uh, richness. But mostly uh, the noticeable thing is that there is a tempo change. It does, does pa 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 And that kind of announces, dude, something is about to change, prepare yourself. This is a very interesting way of you know, ha uh, having a transition and of, uh, of building a transition, you know, by making it clear something is about to change, destroying the balance that we built so far. Up until this point, there's lots of repetitive repetitiveness, but this breaks it, right? And after this, we can introduce the C part. Now, everything we said so far is both in sync with Hans Zimmer's uh, tracks for this, um, like this track and for Bloodborne tracks. But what I'm about to say uh, links those two even more, Hans Zimmer and Bloodborne. The C part is one part of the structure where you take all that you built so far and you pretty much throw it away, right? Because you want to introduce an element of newness. In here, we reach the highest levels of tension yet, right? So if we were to write a C part, which is the same as the B part, but more intense, it would be stupid because it would be so difficult to do this while keeping that dull, dark type of tone in our tracks, right? And especially if we're talking about video game music, and this is a boss track, this is gonna loop over, right? So if we just repeat the B part, but more intense, and then we loop back to the A part, that's gonna be an interesting, because it's the same thing over and over again. After a while, it starts to get boring. But the C part is what solves this problem. With the C part, you do something completely different. So this is what it would sound, it sounds like in this track. And as you might notice right away, the C part is completely different in terms of melodies, in terms of chords, and in terms of rhythms. Even the BPM changes, it's a little bit slower, right? The harmony stays the same because we need to feel like the track is the same. The same, the C part needs to be tied to the, to the other two in terms of maybe mood, in terms of harmonies and stuff like that. It still needs to be recognizable as part of the track, but it needs to have a different motive, right? And it doesn't need to be an evolved part. It needs to be something original, something fresh we haven't heard before. Because before the track loops out again to, to the A part and B part, etc., if we have something which is different it, that breaks the loop, it makes the whole thing more interesting and more like cooler to, to listen to, right? So <clears throat> I'm not, ex not going to explain to you how to write a C part, but there is one thing I want to tell you. I want advice on writing C parts, which sound effective. Now, <clears throat> when it comes to this stuff, people tend to have one problem, that at the end of orchestrating the whole of the A part and the whole of the B part, when they come to the C part and it's a blank, you know, there is a blankness, like they didn't write anything, they're quite lost. They do not know what to come up with, right? And this is because the more you listen to a song, the more you work on a song and you listen back to it, the more the idea of that song gets solid in your mind. So it starts to get a bit difficult for you to um, really come up with new ideas, right? Because you start, you already have a, a main idea of what the song is supposed to sound, sound like after you work for, I don't know, 20 hours on the orchestration of the A part and B part. The way to solve this is very easy. So you pretty much write, like the solution is to write the A motif, the B motif and harmonies and stuff like that, and chords on piano, and the C motif on piano straight away, like you write the, the three things, A, B, and C on piano, a very fast piano mock-up. The first thing you do without orchestrating, without losing time on orchestrating. So you spend, I don't know, one hour to come up with a cool piano mock-up from A to C, to the end of C. And after you did that and the mock-up sounds good to you and it sounds structured and everything, you can then go use that mock-up as the, the main map that is going to guide you throughout the whole arranging and orchestration um, phases. 
and you take your time and you arrange the uh, orchestrate the A part, then you orchestrate the B part, and then you orchestrate the C part, which you are already going to have in your map because you've wrote it down at the beginning of your um your track, you know. So that's one thing you can do, and it's something that professional composers do actually. They usually um, come up with piano mockups of their tracks, and then after they orchestrate them, even Hans Zimmer does that. I think he pretty much jams on uh, on the piano for like 40 minutes or something and it creates a lot of themes and motifs and then he structurizes them structurizes them then structurizes them and out of those structures he orchestrates his pieces but he creates the map first so that's a cool way to assure that you have a nice c part to write it beforehand with all the rest now, what I want to talk about now is the importance of layering. Now, as I said before, layering, there is a tutorial about that called um, How to Layer Huge Cinematic Impacts and stuff like that on my channel, which I suggest you to watch. And layering is the master, master detail of all. And it explains orchestration. Like, it explains everything about orchestration, honestly. If you get it right, you're, you're going to be able to write amazing orchestral music. And... Let's now understand, like I want you to understand what is what it, you know, a track which is not layered sounds like. So, for example, in here we have the French horn, etc., which sounds amazing, like this. It is super huge, and there is a reason for that. Layering. Let's see what happens if I remove all the layers from this French horn. Um, so Sorry. Um, so yeah, let's remove this as well. So this, I, I removed pretty much all the layers, all the things that I used to enforce that French horn. Let's see what it sounds like now. You notice? There is something that lacks. There is something that we're missing, right? And beginners usually do not understand when, when they have this problem that something sounds empty. Something they do is maybe they increase the French horn's volume. So let's maybe try to do that. Let's um, make the French horns more noticeable by increasing them. Let's see what happens. Right, we can hear them a little bit more. But it's not this. So with layering, I mean, for example, the French horn. If we analyze them on the uh, of the um, on the spectrum of frequencies, we notice they're much more present here, but they have no low end, and you know their um, frequency response is quite. It's not that broad, right? But I want this bam bam sound to sound more prominent, more huge, and stuff. So one way in which you can do that in terms of orchestration is to uh, surround the French horns with instruments which are present in the ranges where the French horn is not that much present. So adding, for example, basses. For the basses, I added, like, it's not playing the same notes as the French horn, I think, but it's conveying that sense. Like, it's, it's pretty much creating harmony, but on um, a register and frequencies which the French horn are not populating. But I'm still not pleased. I wanted this to sound so huge, so I decided to add bass trombones as well. Better, but still not good enough. So I added chimbasi, which are playing on another register again. It's a low register like the bass trombone, but they sound even more, like a bit different, so... Then I added cellos on a higher register and higher octaves, higher notes again. And now we have that foundation for the French horn. But to, you know, bring things to another level again, to give some air to the whole thing, I decided to add the, more, the most airy of instruments, so the choir. 
but I didn't want to, like, I wanted the French horn to be the on the spotlight. So I made sure to not add instruments, which have a higher register than the French horns. And I made sure to not add instrument on higher octaves than the one played by the French horn. So I used man choir, which is quite low on low octaves. That's not bad. Then I added some synths and they are playing, you know, low, low, low notes like the bass. So now what we hear now is just the foundation on top of which the French horn is gonna soar and sound amazing. Which is much more impressive than this. See the difference? This is done with layering. If you understand layering, which I explained in the other tutorial about layering in cinematic hits, the, that technique can be used about anything about orchestration. And it's gonna increase the quality of your tracks a lot. I, I mean it, like really a lot. And then um, in here, we pretty much have the same thing where we, we add details and increase the octaves as it goes. So. We have, along with the huge, big ass uh, French horn and stuff, we have uh, violas and first violin playing this ostinato, I think. After a while, um, I wanted to change, thing, change things, right? To, to make them more more intense and more interesting. So what I did is I added that um, ostinato on first violins on higher octaves and on women choir. And it makes things more intense. And uh, yeah, the mix is what it is, but um, the main idea behind the arrangement is solid. Instead, uh, the team Pani and Tom's and stuff, they're just playing very simple notes. Which are pretty much enforcing the, um, you know, the French horns and stuff at the same rhythm. Simple. So this C part is completely different. And now this is a film soundtrack or because it's uh, Hans Zimmer, but you also have this type of stuff in uh, Bloodborne and C parts can be anything, can be a breakdown. So something way more soft and calm or something more big and dangerous like this one, right? But the main thing is that they need to be, is they need to be different from everything that we heard before but still fit inside the context of the song. So it's pretty much like an alternate ver version of the song or an alternate, alternate verse of the song. And then after you can have another A part, another B part and an outro, or you can just end it after the C part and you can make it loop again, right? If we're talking about video game music. So that's uh, structure and arrangement. In terms of mix, like, well, what, most of what I did was just volume balancing, to be honest. Um, and also, like, one thing I suggested to do is um, to um, actually, there's one thing I do. Like, I go on Google and I search orchestra, orchestra setting or something like that. And you, when you search that on Google Images, you find pictures of how, like, diagrams of how the orchestra is usually set up, right? So I use those to manage the panning. And yeah, I pan the instrument to make the whole thing sound more atmosp not atmospheric, more, more distributed, right? Because another uh, mistake that beginners do is that their tracks sound super centric and that's not how an, an orchestra sounds because it's distributed throughout various settings, right? So using a guide like that and uh, panning your instruments is a good thing to do. Sometimes they are pre-panned, but if you add a bit more panning, it sounds even more broad. And then I did just volume balancing and managed reverb uh, as I usually, like, as I explained in my reverb tutorial with this thing here. And uh, yeah, then there's a bit of mastering and stuff, um, but I'm going to explain that in other tutorials. But yeah, in terms of arrangement and orchestration, that's 
the whys and the hows to write Bloodborne music. Now, if you want to access the stems of this track and analyze it yourself in your DAW, you can do that. I offer the stems of every single track I put out on YouTube on my Patreon page. So if you're interested in that, go check out the description of this video. There is a link to Patreon where you can go and get the downloads for the stems of every song I put out. So you can analyze it yourself and understand and, you know, see for yourself how I write my stuff. And if you're instead like completely lost and you do not know where to start with the things I mentioned in this tutorial, no problem. Like in this channel, you're going to find tutorials about many things that we discussed today that go way more in depth. So there is a 20 minute tutorial on how to write for strings in a realistic way, how to arrange brass in an epic way, how to write epic choir and how to write super amazing percussion and stuff like that in this tutorial channel. There's lots of stuff. And even if you're new, like if you're not new, if you're one of my subscribers, I'm sure I put out dozens of videos that you might have lost track of. So I suggest you all to go back and check out the videos on the channel. And as a third thing, if you want to learn even more about this stuff, be guided and followed, like not, not followed, but guided. There is the Avalanche course, which I mentioned in the beginning of the video. That course just um, underwent an update. So there's even more stuff now. And if you were subscribed before, the updates are free. If you're not, like it's more free stuff for like more stuff for you. And yeah, if you're interested in that, interested in that course, go check it out. The link is in the description of this video, and it's gonna teach you a lot, preventing you from bashing your head against the wall with no idea what you're doing. So that's that. And uh, if you have questions about what we discussed today in this video. Feel free to ask them in the comments of this video. And if you want to help me out a little bit, share this video with friends and communities of composers who might earn value out of this. So yeah, that will be all for today. I'll see you later.